one in uh, precision division and the division uh, champion in sporter which is uh, a lot of the junior high school rotc programs participate in that event uh, was cody bates and he was from lebanon high school jrotc sponsored by post 51. And our precision division state champion was Raquel Coburn uh, from the Colonel Allison Junior Rifle Club out of Salem, sponsored by Capital Post 9. And I would also like to mention that uh, Lebanon High School, the sporter team, which consisted of Alexander Eichlinboom, Jasmine Wiles, Cody Bates, and Michael Langdon, won the 2015 American Legion National Championships for the Sporter Division. So, so it, was, it was a great year for shooting sports. Uh, one of those individuals from Lebanon High School, Alexander Eichlinboom, did qualify for the individual national championships for the American Legion. Uh, and that will play, take place at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. Uh, July 21st to the 25th. So we're definitely behind them and thank you very much. I'll give you, I'll give you some of these plaques and you can take to them. <clears throat> now we have Boy Scouts. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Larry Whitmire, and I'm representing the uh, Scout Commission. David Bone is the, cha is the chairman and not able to be here today. I think one of the things that we'd like to emphasize is uh, our Eagle Scout of the Year Award. And what we'd like to say is that, uh, aside from the fact that we had no applications this year, we're going to make sure that next year, the application forms get out to all the posts and everybody knows exactly what the qualifications are. Uh, it's an awesome award, and, uh, and we really should have an Eagle Scout of the Year nationwide out of this department. The second thing is uh, that we've, uh, we've been liaising with all of the, the, uh, the posts that do not have scout units and uh, recommending that they consider sponsoring a scout unit. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort to do that. It takes a little manpower, maybe a little bit of finance, not a lot, but a big commitment because what we're doing in the scouting program is building leadership. And that's leadership for our nation. So thank you very much. My post, we finally got our first uh, Cub Scout troop this last year, and they had one fundraiser. These are 10 little nine-year, eight-year-old, seven-year-old kids. They raised $1,100 in one, week, one weekend. I, my post can't even do that. Girl State, Tony Epperson. Good afternoon. Um, our Girl State session this year was probably one of the best we've had. We had a great staff. We had great young ladies coming in. Um, we did some, a few different things. We had a police department. Thanks to Boys State and they're, and they're going out and finding a sheriff's program for our girls and boys. And for the first time in a very long time, we had um, tickets. They, if they violated the rules, they got a ticket and they had to go to court. And they actually got a punishment and it was usually community service, which meant they had to clean up after a, an, a, an event. But at this time, I would like to introduce two special people that are here that went to Girl State. One is Laura Chan. <laughs> Laura's been on staff for two years now. And our other special guest is Cassie Grossman. <laughs> this was Cassie's first year as a returning staff member and she will be returning next year. 
And do you have anything you want to say, Cassie, briefly? I'm going to change things up a little bit. I was going to have you last, but I think I'm going to have Carol last. So Don Epperson with Boy State. Good afternoon. Hey, that was a good lunch. Yeah. Okay, that was great. So Boys State uh, this year, we had 130 boys graduate from the program. Uh, we had the governor on, uh, on Monday. Uh, she spent an hour with our boys and girls. Uh, we, we do share, in case, in case you're not aware, aware of it, guest speakers uh, to the programs. So uh, on Tuesday, we had the Secretary of State and her, uh, and her uh, mock election team. Uh, run a mock election for the kids. That was a lot of fun. And uh, we had the, the one of the chief justices, uh, Jack Landau. Uh, we had the mayor from Albany, or uh, yeah, Albany. And we had a lot of wonderful speakers. Yeah. It was a great time. Uh, the young people learned a lot. But just suppose for a moment, okay, uh, if we had a Boys State program and and nobody came. Wow. You know, nobody came. So, we do have a couple of gentlemen in the audience here who did come to Boys State. And so, we're going to ask them to come up here. The first one is going to be Ryan Edsel. Uh, Ryan is from uh, McNary High School. And uh, might as well bring both of you up at the same time. Kai McPeters, he is from Jesuit High School. Both of these gentlemen were uh, Boys Nation um, uh, representatives from the great state of Oregon last year, and they came back this summer uh, to be our senators and uh, help us run the program. So, each of you just. Very good. Uh, so again, my name is Kai McPeters, and this is Ryan Edsel, and uh, we're just so thankful to have had the opportunity last year to go to Nation. Um, we had uh, not only the opportunity to participate in a Senate simulation, but also get a, a, a lot of exposure to some pretty significant leaders who impact, you know, the world around us, um, and have a pretty drastic impact in a lot of people's lives. It was uh, almost indescribable to put into words, but some of the events we did at Nation, uh, we toured the Pentagon, we went to the Greenbelt American Legion Post in Maryland, we also went to the Arlington Cemetery and watched the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It was just unbelievably rewarding in the experience there. I wish I could tell you all about it, but we don't have very much more time left, so. Um, yeah, there, there's one moment that comes to mind. Uh, we were waiting in um, one of the rooms off the Oval Office it was during one of the uh, during the border crisis, and so there were three or four presidents of uh, Central American states leaving the Oval Office, while the rest of um, us and 96 other senators, two from every state in the Union, were singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic as the President of the United States walked down the hall. And that's just an experience that only really an American Legion can provide. So we're just uh, so thankful. Thank you. What you guys just said, so yeah. Right. I don't want to do this too. You didn't come up. 
Good. But I, there's two gentlemen here in the audience that have uh, been working with me uh, and our team. When I say our team, I'm talking about the Oregon American Legion uh, Boys State Commission. Uh, these two gentlemen who are represent the Sons of American Legion from Capitol Post 9. Uh, right hand and a left hand. It's okay, but the point I'm trying to get to is that uh, these two guys really spearheaded uh, uh, putting this program together over the last seven years uh, without their help, okay, and without their dedication and love to the program, it wouldn't happen. So please, come on up, Brian and Steve. I'm very proud to uh, uh, to just be a team member with these guys, and uh, they allowed me the opportunity to uh, uh, not be so hands-on. You know, in order for young people to grow, you've got to give them the opportunities. Thanks, Bob. Got anything to say? Oh, here. Yeah. And they can let him talk. Thank you. Have to get the, this is what you do, what the school for to learn. Well, I just like to really, all I have to say is that if it wasn't for Don Epperson, none of the things that we've done in the past seven years would have happened. So, really, it's all thanks to Mr. Epperson here. I can follow up on that comment. Don is, uh, has allowed us to kind of explore and and they spread our wings and, and to uh, really expand the program into new and exciting areas. And the only thing we need now is just more kids to come. And so we just ask that all, all posts uh, stay as involved as you can, and send as many kids as you can, even if it's more than two. We, we have money, we can, we can figure it out. So please send as many kids as you can, thanks. And uh, William Chan, where are you, William? Uh, William's back there. Uh, and you ladies, I don't know if you're aware of, uh, you know, who my commission is. So Jim Craig's in the audience. Um, uh, please, is Jim Willis here? No? Okay. Ian Gerstel. Okay. There's another gentleman named John Gilbert. He was uh, supposed to be with us uh, the week of Boys State, but uh, he's doing an internship, and but he'll be back on the commission hopefully this next year. Uh, he is a uh, Annapolis graduate and a Marine Corps pilot, uh, retired. So uh, we're looking forward to him coming on board. And uh, I just want to uh, thank you all again for your uh, contributions to this great program. Thank you. Okay, the next group you get is the oratorical contest. And Carol Bova Rice, uh, I'm gonna let you, her introduce. Actually, it's a heck of a kid. Hi, I'm Carol Bova Rice, your department oratorical chairman. For those of you that do not know what the oratorical program is, it's a speech contest and scholarship and it's about the Constitution of the United States. Each contestant must prepare an eight to 10 minute oration on some point of the Constitution. And, <coughs> excuse me. Then there are four assigned topics that are different articles of the Constitution. 
they have to prepare a three to five minute speech on all four of them because they won't know which one is chosen to be for that competition. And it may not be, you start at post, then go to district, go to area, and then go to department. So you could have four different assigned topics chosen at each one, or you can have the same one chosen each one. So you have to be prepared to speak on all four of them. And it is not easy. Let me tell you, I admire each one of these kids. I would never, ever be able to do it. And we're very fortunate that this year it's a family affair. We have Sarah Aldridge, who was our last year winner, stand up Sarah, and went to national to represent Oregon. And this year's winner is her brother, James Aldridge. And he went a representative. And you all are in for a treat because we've asked for James to present his eight to 10 minute oratorical for you right now. Everyone ready? I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. To any past or current military members hearing this, this may sound a little, if not completely, familiar. This is the oath every United States Army officer takes. All branches of the military, as well as the president and other members of the government, take some form of this oath. But why is this oath taken, and what is its purpose? What do the words protect and defend the Constitution mean, and do they only apply to those in public office? Should all citizens bear the same weight of responsibility from this oath as those who take it? Today we're going to be taking a look at the phrase protect and defend the Constitution, what it means, where it is used, and who it applies to. So first off, what does it mean? Well, in order to understand the meaning of this phrase, we must first take a look at the purpose of the Constitution. The Constitution was put in place to lay out not only the rules and regulations of our society, but also a picture of what we stand for. The Constitution is essentially a basis of American ideals. By laying down a standard for human rights, we lay down a standard for what we believe. The Constitution is essentially a picture of American ideals and principles. So if the Constitution defines American ideals and principles, then agreeing to protect and defend the Constitution goes far beyond simply agreeing to protect words on a paper. It's an agreement to defend, at all costs, a standard set of principles. All military oaths, as well as the oath of honor for law enforcement and the oath of office for president use this phrase. Why is this oath taken? Well, the reason this oath is taken is to prove loyalty to America's founding principles. It's also an agreement to defend at any and all costs a standard set of principles against anyone who would attempt to threaten them. When the World Trade Centers were attacked, President George W. Bush stated our way of life was under attack and following that declared, the search is underway for those who committed these evil acts. I redirected the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. When he swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, his intent was to follow through on that oath. All of the military that helped in the war on terror following these acts also put into action the words they said when they joined the United States Armed Forces. But was it only the responsibility of the military and those in public office to defend the Constitution? Do we also, as citizens of the United States, in a sense, take an oath of office? Many people do not know there is actually an oath that all legal immigrants must take before becoming naturalized citizens. Within it are these words. I will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. 
that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. The same words sworn by those who joined the United States Armed Forces are the same words said by those who desire to call themselves true American citizens. That means anyone who claims to be a true American citizen bears the same weight of responsibility of protecting and defending the Constitution. This is one problem with our society today. Our society today tends to neither feel a need nor responsibility to defend the Constitution. It tends to forget it is equally their responsibility to defend their rights. This is in part because many people do not know what their rights are. According to a survey taken by USA Today, less than half of Americans know what year the Constitution was ratified, and less than 40% of Americans know the branches of government laid down within it. Plato once said, dictatorship naturally arises out of democracy, and the most aggravated forms of tyranny and slavery out of the most extreme liberty. In some ways, this statement is true. Our founding fathers originally fought for the right to freedom of speech, yet recently a young man in California was told he could not take signatures for a petition because he was outside of the free speech zone. Our founding fathers originally fought for the right to bear arms, yet now the state government of New York is allowed to ban any handgun it deems unsafe. Our founding fathers originally fought for the freedom of religion, yet now people are being told they cannot pray in public because it might offend people. Our founding fathers originally fought for the right to privacy, and now the NSA is capable of monitoring everything we ever say. Many of the actions that were taken by the British government that spurred on the American Revolution are very similar to the actions our government is taking today for the sake of security. What Plato said is true only when the next generation forgets what it was that was fought for and against in the first place. Our society has been allowed to forget what it was that our founding fathers fought for. Today, too many people believe that we should not point out anyone's wrongs, no matter how bad they might be, because they might be offended. It tends towards the idea that political correctness ought to be upheld at the cost of governmental overstep. Too many people believe that the government can do whatever it wants simply because it's the government. But our founding fathers did not fight for a country and a government that can do whatever it wanted with an executive order. They fought for freedom from tyranny, a tyranny that our society has slowly allowed to seep back in. When it is said, I will protect and defend the Constitution, it did not simply say against foreign enemies, but also those domestic. That doesn't just mean those who stand up and flat out say they're going to destroy the Constitution, but also those who attempt to usurp and take down the Constitution under a different mask, such as security or tolerance. This is the apathy that is taking place in our country today. Today, America can less and less be described as the home of freedom and justice, and more and more the home of security and tolerance. While these do have their place, they should never take precedence over and definitely never come at the cost of our founding fathers' principles. The oath of office for citizenship is an oath that requires we uphold and defend the Constitution against all abuse, both physical and political. Albert Einstein once said, the strength of the Constitution lies entirely in the determination of each citizen to defend it. Only if every citizen feels duty bound to do his share in this defense are the constitutional rights secured. Our rights are only safe when we choose to defend them. Our Constitution is only strong when we personally choose to fight for it. Maybe true citizenship is shown when, given the chance, we either uphold and defend the Constitution or stand by and allow it to be assailed and abused. Will we stand up for our Founding Fathers' principles, or will we stand by and see their ideals slowly taken away from us? We are all bound by oath, whether verbally stated or not, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution defends our rights, yet many choose not to defend it. Why is this? Do we truly know what it means to protect and defend the Constitution? Now we all know we must personally defend our rights, but how? How can one person protect and defend the Constitution? While there are the obvious ways, such as joining the military or law enforcement, there are ways we can protect our rights each and every day. It can start by simply making sure we know what our rights are. By knowing our rights, we can see when they are being violated and protect both our rights and the rights of others. 
by making use of the rights the Constitution offers us. We can start movements to raise awareness for the need to protect our founding fathers' principles. We can teach our children and our children's children that the freedoms that were fought for are still being fought for today and that the battle will soon become theirs. But in the end, it all comes down to one thing. Our founding fathers fought for a fundamental right, the right to choose. That's what this all comes down to, a choice. We can either use or abuse this right. We can either use this right to uphold and defend our founding fathers' principles, or we can stand by and see their principles slowly taken away from us. We are given the right to decide, but our choice must be made before the decision is taken from us. We must choose to stand for our founding fathers' principles. We must defend their ideals. We must fight for the freedom that they believed in. We must make a choice, and our choice must be this. We must choose to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Thank you. I was an escort last year, so I didn't get to listen to this, so it was my first time too. If you got a chance to go to the convention or the oratorical, go to it. These kids are great, all of them. Sarah, you want to come up? And I got one left. Well, you drove him over, and I wasn't making these last year either, so. I'd like to thank everybody for coming over for our Americanism luncheon. I'd like to thank uh, the Elks for hosting us here, Terry Ward for the great cooking the turkey, and uh, thank you all, and let's go back to work now. <laughs>